היי, גשם כבר נכנסת. Yeshima will be with us in a minute. Sorry. Okay, wait, can you hear me? Sorry, I apologize. I got it wrong with the timing. I thought it was an hour and a half. Okay, now just to make sure I don't get even more confused, um, we've got an hour and a half now, is that right? An hour and a half now, 30 minutes break. 30 minutes break. Okay, okay, great. Okay, my apologies again. I, I thought it was an hour and a half. Okay, great. <clears throat> I mean, the break, I thought it was an hour and a half. All right, so let's start, of course, very important, especially now after the break, to again, uh, remember the motivation, remember the reason we are studying the 12 links. So to generate once again, based on compassion for all sentient beings, the determination to remove the suffering of all sentient beings based on that, generating the determination to become fully enlightened for the sake of all sentient beings. Okay, all right, and now Returning to <coughs> returning to the meditation, we've done the meditation based on the forward sequence, starting with ignorance, giving rise to formative actions, etc. Now we we'll do the same thing, the same meditation again, um, but in the reversed uh, fashion. So again. The, the example we've chosen, there are different types, um, but choosing the example of where in our first rebirth we were human and we accumulated the karma to be reborn as an animal. In the second rebirth, being human, again human, um, because of a different uh, throwing karma, we are, exist as a human being and then towards the end of that life, the karmic imprint that was previously left on the continuum uh, for an animal rebirth, that now ripens. And in the third life, uh, birth, starting with birth and so forth, um, we are an animal. Okay, so taking that as the basis, let's do a meditation to just reflect on now the reverse sequence of the 12 links. Okay. 
first focus on breathing as before. And now think of yourself in the form of some type of animal. An animal <clears throat> that goes through the stages of aging and eventually experiences the moment of death. So aging and death. They are the result of, and therefore depend on, birth. That is due to conception. At the beginning of this life, aging and death took place. Birth, of course, happened in dependence on existence, which is the actualized form of the karmic seat. that lasted from the moment in our previous life the karmic seed had been actualized until a moment before conception and the life as an animal. existence, that state of the seed becoming active, that arose in dependence on grasping. Grasping at the self, grasping at the existence, samsaric existence.
and then grasping is the result of a lesser version of this type of afflicted desire, which is craving. Craving for the self, the existence of the self. Due to one's impending death. So this is the type of mind that will arise at the moment of our death in this lifetime. There will be craving for existence, craving for the I. That craving arose in dependence on feeling. Feeling in particular at the moment of death. Just most likely an unpleasant feeling. with feeling, of course, being the driving force in our life, giving rise to attachment, aversion, ignorance, depending on the type of feeling. And feeling arises in dependence on contact, on perceiving, objects with our five sense consciousnesses and the mental consciousness. which for the first time takes place within the womb. this contact being preceded by the fact that our sense consciousness is the basis for that for them the sources developed at the moment when the cells of the fertilized egg started to divide and multiply up to the moment until they were fully functioning or able a moment later to give rise to the link of contact. Which is why contact has arisen in dependence on the six sense sources.
and the six sense forces in turn, they arose in dependence on name and form. That is the moment of conception. When our mind entered the fertilized egg of our mother, that moment of the mind entering the fertilized egg before the process of cell division started. Therefore, the six sense sources depended on the consciousness entering our mother's fertilized egg. The link of name and form that depended on the resultant consciousness. Holding the karmic seat to be reborn as an animal and having left, having separated from the body of our previous life. Therefore, conception of this life depends on the resultant consciousness that has not yet been conceived and that has separated from a previous life. resultant consciousness has arisen in dependence on a causal consciousness. Consciousness that has not left, has not separated from the previous body yet, and which holds the seat the throwing karma, the animal throwing karma. And the causal Consciousness that holds that seed, that is the result of the formative action. The action that is the throwing karma, which will eventually give rise to a birth as an animal. Therefore, the basis for that karmic seat that was left after the action was complete. That causal consciousness is the result of the formative action. And 
an affirmative action. As well as all the other links have arisen from the misapprehension, the first link of ignorance. The mind that perceives the I and all of the phenomena to exist independently, not dependent on labeling, having their own independent entity. Now, whatever conclusion you've come to as a result of this meditation on the reverse order of the afflicted 12 links, spend a few moments focusing on that single pointedly, allowing for your insight. To become part the deeper levels of your mind. Okay, so slowly rise from your meditation. All right. Now, previously there was a question, it's gone now, but it's uh, an interesting question. I'd like to answer it before I forget. Um, the question is, um, regarding, who asked this question again? Tom, is that you? Forget now who asked, no, it wasn't you, okay. Forget who asked the question. Anyway, um, regarding POA, when to apply POA? When should you apply a galama applying POA? Well, POA is a translation of, usually translated as transferal of consciousness, as in like a lama. Um, can through a particular ritual um, influence the emergence, that is the separation of your mind from your body, and through that possibly um, trigger the ripening of a karmic seed that allows you, that enables you to be reborn in the higher realms. Now, this is um, quite popular in the uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition and in some traditions it's practiced more there's more emphasis on it of course depending on the person's death etc but the question that arises in that context is well if the karma the well at the time of existence existence being the name given to the state when the karma has started to ripen and I said once the karma has ripened there's no going back and so if that's the case, well, then how does poor in any way help? Well, that's the question, of course. I mean, there's definitely a time. And when when is that time of no going back? That is a different question altogether. Well, it could be at different times when uh, that moment comes. And if power is done previous to that, it could still be reversed, possibly 
this ritual and this i don't think it's the ritual alone there must be a, a, a karmic connection to that person ideally uh, the person must have also created the causes the karmic causes for such a reversal to be effective many causes and conditions have to come together but we just don't know whether they're there or not and we do it anyway if there is someone qualified to perform the ritual now uh, therefore we don't know when the moment is when the person when that state is irreversible um, and up to then it's still definitely beneficial to do poor it could it could be that the karma is fully ripened and now there's no going back uh, just before or maybe right after right after the mind and body have separated i mean maybe well then it'd be difficult because you wouldn't know it has to be i think it has to be before death because otherwise uh, the intermediate state that is already determined by the ripening of that karma but of course we're also dealing with fluctuating karma in that although you cannot totally reverse it but possibly changes are possible um, that are positive I, I don't know in whichever way because it's not really described in the texts but maybe since it is fluctuating in from the point of view of a person, just an ordinary person. So to be reborn in the uh, form and formless realm, I mean, you don't need Pawa anyway. Um, it's ba basically your karma is set and it's also you, the, it comes along with the wish to be reborn for an ordinary person, for someone who's meditated on these levels, who's not a bodhisattva. Well, this is where they're going to be reborn at. And um, yeah, well... I guess it's not really necessary in that case also to perform poor because you're not going into the lower realms. But for someone who could possibly go into the lower realms, even if the karma is already ripened and there's no going back as such, there may be an adjustment that is still better than if that hadn't taken place. So the point is we don't know whether poor is always successful. It could be um, that the karma is not yet fully ripened and maybe that process is reversed and another karma can ripen due to that um, in a different situation, like giving rise to a different situation. Um, and um, yeah, so, th so those are, I think, the possibility that there is a change. But I think... If it's done after death, I don't know how could that how that could help. Maybe cause a death of that particular being uh, that could potentially be reborn in a lower realm, and then rather have another trigger another karma. Maybe that's also a possibility. Like the karma is ripened in the form of a, a um, an in between state being, an intermediate state being, and then dies in that moment, like prematurely. A karma is triggered that causes the death and another karma altogether is newly um ripens newly that would possibly be another possibility but then the person really needs to have a strong connection to that lama i would say think that th this can then be triggered that the lama can actually trigger such a karma so the lama can serve as the cooperative condition with the ritual with the karmic connection with of course the karma of the person dying most importantly um then trigger another karma after it has started ripening but that induced a small death and instead another karma is ripened all this is possible i i think but then I always, I always remember something that Geshe Tutum Pesang once said, because he comes from, um, well, he was born in Nepal at the border to Tibet. He is uh, ethically Tibetan, but politically he's part of Nepal. Uh, there are these um, old kind of like the Sherpas and there are other kind of um, groups of people who originally came from Tibet and their, their main tradition is the Nyingma tradition. So his father himself forget whether he's still alive or whether he passed away anyway uh is a was or is a great uh practitioner of the nyingma tradition and um has great belief in poa and geshe said he's always had these uh, conversations with his dad about this kind of debates about this and geshe argues that the best poa is not the ritual by the lama the best poa is bodhicitta Bodhicitta, if we can generate bodhicitta at the time of death, he says that's the best form of transferring your consciousness in a positive way. So 
the Gishla has said that, and I've heard other lamas saying similar, making similar statements to that effect, which is one of the reasons I stress just generating bodhicitta, however, however weak it is in comparison to the real bodhicitta, like bodhicitta that someone and someone generates and generates a moment later to be to be to enter the path of accumulation. Um, that is not the case for us. Our bodhicitta doesn't have that force, doesn't have for, force, doesn't have that spontaneity. Um, instead, it's just it's a it's a and contrived version it's a contrived and a fake kind of version of the real deal but still it, it definitely holds a force that can that can have a huge influence on our death and in that way i believe if we familiarize ourselves over and over even however fake it is just remind ourselves to generate it 10 times a day 20 times a day and on sundays i usually stress this a lot as part of the the homework I usually give you for the entire week, I always talk about generated, set in an app, set an alarm clock, um, different methods to generate this over and over again. Because I believe if you, without the other techniques, of course, you need to go through the techniques of exchanging self for others, uh, of the seven, the six causes and one effect to make it most powerful. But in the meantime, to just familiarize with it over and over again, I believe that at the time of death, if you become familiar enough with it, that will protect you. That will protect you in the way Geshe described it. So if you, of course, near a Lama and you have a strong connection to your personal Lama who has the ability to, to do power, great. But if you want to be on the safe side, meditate on bodhicitta. That is the way in which you perform your own power. Let's put it that way. Okay, that was the answer to my question. Sorry, that was a little bit, I'm not sure. So I gave you three possibilities and hopefully they make sense. Either you do it early enough or um, it's adjusted in a positive way through POA. So since the karma is fluctuating, so they, the Lama can make adjustments that are the best possible. Or the third would be that the Lama causes a death in, like in the Pardo already causes a death in that particular life. And then through the ritual causes another karma to be, um, to come forth, come forth. So in that way, when the karma is irreversible, yes, you've already taken a short, uh, you've already had a short effect of that in the pardo or even at birth, then you die prematurely, maybe even as a baby, as a, I don't know, a, 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 a puppy. And then instead are reborn as a human being, even that is possibly uh, is a possibility so these are just my um, my guess with regard to that and you should ask a lama uh, then there's a question what is the substantial cause of feeling tom has this question what is the substantial cause of feelings is it true to say that feeling is the only link that is integral to the mind afflicted with ignorance or otherwise well, it's integral to the mind in that it's a function of the mind to have feeling but so is contact too um, and whether the mind is afflicted with ignorance or not, every mind has the function of feeling. Every mind has the function of making contact. In fact, when you have contact, you always have feeling. But here, the kind of feeling we're describing is a feeling that arises from the contact. So when you initially perceive, for instance, an unpleasant object, there's contact with the unpleasant object, but you don't perceive it as such yet. A mental process sets in, you reflect upon it, and seeing it as unpleasant um, initially may just be seen as neutral. If you encounter a person, they say something to you and your first reaction is still neutral, but then that slowly changes into an unpleasant feeling, for instance. So all those, this feeling and this contact here, in this case, contact gave rise to this particular feeling here. And they are integral to the mind. They're part of the mind. They're linked to the mind in that they're functions of the mind that are always present. But in particular here, when it comes to pleasant or unpleasant feelings, they trigger uh, well, in this case here, craving, giving rise to rebirth, etc., um, which is why it's described here um, independently. And what is the therefore this function of feeling, which is a function of the mind? What is its substantial cause? The previous moment of of feeling, which is part of the previous moment of mind. 
Okay, so in that case, think of mind as a as a continuum, as an ever existing continuum with these functions of feeling, contact, discrimination, and so forth. And each of these mental factors, which are just mental functions of the mind, their previous, their substantial cause is the former moment of feeling, in the case of feeling, former moment of discrimination, in the case of discrimination, former moment of um, contact, and so forth. Does that make sense? Good, so we're done with that. Now, the purified version. Purified version now, I just wanna explain you one Tibetan word that you may find interesting um, that comes up a lot. And as I did before previously, just to give you an explanation of this word that we use a lot, but it's not clearly defined. Well, there are three words. Let me think, is it three words? Yeah. There's world, existence, and samsara. Samsara, existence, and world. Those words are used a lot and used at different times differently. So korlo, korwa, no, korlo means uh, wheel. Korwa, korwa means samsara. Kor actually means round, cyclic, wheel. Kor law is wheel. So it kind of has that cyclic existence. It's turned into cyclic existence. It became, it was translated as existence of cyclic existence, which is nicely described by the 12 links, for instance. We're over and over, we're reborn. We create new causes to be reborn. We are reborn. And because we're reborn, we create new causes. And in that way, in that cyclic kind of, has the, connotation, has the connotation of cyclic existence of the cycle. Then the other word is sipa, which is existence, the, the same word that we use as the 10th the link. And we've heard there are four types, which of course, if you talk about samsara, you can talk about these four types in the same way because sipa, existence, in general sipa um, and korra, that is cyclic existence and existence described here, in general they are um, equivalent. Although number 10 is not existence as such, it's ex existence of birth, as I said before. The, it's actually existence of birth in Tibetan, kesi, where you have the word sipa and you add together the word birth and it becomes kesi, kewa sipa or kesi. So existence, the 11th link is strictly speaking not just existence, not just psych, not just existence in samsara, but uh, existence of birth, that is conception in cyclic existence. Now, what I'm trying to say is that existence, the word existence here, sipa and korra, cyclic existence are actually equivalent, which is why it makes sense this fourfold division of existence into prior existence, existence of birth, existence of death, existence, intermediate existence, where you find the same division for um, samsara. Now, what is samsara? What is this siba in general? What is this existence in general, worldly existence, if you like, or samsaric existence? It actually refers to the five aggregates. Sometimes we like to think of samsara as the place as like the container, which is the, the world around us, the things around us, and then the person who's born within it. But if you think about it, if you think about it um, thoroughly, in particular, if you take into consideration this example of a liquid that humans perceive as water, animals, um, humans perceive as water, preta beings perceive as pus and blood, and celestial beings perceive as nectar, well, it's pretty obvious that the the result, the, the environment that I live in, me, myself as a person, is of course the result of my karma and therefore the result of my mind. And in that way, very subjective, very subjective. And I just share a karma with other people so they have a similar experience, but these people are all humans or maybe animals. For other living beings having a, a different kind of karma, the, the environment they perceive is very different from what I perceive. Okay, now that being the case, therefore, when I say cyclic existence, there's my cyclic existence, which is basically the my 
perception of this world and my mind and body as I perceive them, which are a result of the action I accumulated in the past. So it includes the environment I live in, but again, the environment as I perceive it, the environment as I perceive it is the result of my karma. And I individually perceive it in a certain way, which someone else doesn't perceive in the same way. So that's important to remember. Therefore, cyclic existence and existence, worldly existence, to translate it as worldly existence, Sipa, the 10th link, that out of the context of the 12 links can be translated as worldly existence, and oftentimes it is, refers to really the five aggregates. And then you have the word world. World, that's usually, in Tibetan, it's usually translated, it usually translates the Tibetan word jikten, jikten. Jik means to transform, to change, to disintegrate. Disintegrate is actually to disintegrate. And then is the basis, the basis of disintegration, which also again refers to the five aggregates. The basis of all our experiences disintegrating are the five aggregates. So the world here, world as in like worldly activities, worldly mind, that world is again samsara. So in a way, the three world, words for the same thing, if you like, although sometimes they use slightly differently. Kora, which is samsara, then worldly existence, sipa, and word, world itself. So jikten, the world. So we talk about different worlds, and different world systems, and the universe, and all that. That is all part of this jikten. So on more on a cosmological level, you use the word jikten, the word world. On the level of uh, the 12 links, for instance, you use more of the words worldly existence, while in the context of just samsara versus nirvana, you use the word samsara depending on the context. But just to give you a sense that even the description of the world, the way we perceive it as this container, this objective container that we independently are born into and we just experience all the same, no, that doesn't exist. All right. That was just on as a side note uh, to yeah, become a little bit more familiar with the terminology that is used and, of course, what is meant by it. Now, the last um part now is of course the purified version of the 12 links the purified version and again in dependence on ourselves of course before we um move towards the mahayana motivation in particular so or the mahayana practice in the context of these 12 links now the what is the purified version of the 12 links it's pretty straightforward it's um, there's a forward sequence and there's a reverse sequence. So just to remind you, what about the afflicted version? There are two two versions. The forward version is saying, due to ignorance, formative actions arise. Due to formative actions, causal consciousness arises. Due to causal consciousness, um, resultant consciousness arises, and so forth, all all the way to the end, aging and death. Then, and this is basically mainly from the point of view of the origin of suffering. So in that way, we recognize also to free ourselves from all the sufferings that the origin, that is ignorance, gives rise to. Ignorance and formative actions. And then there is the reverse version that we just meditated on. Aging and death are produced in dependence on birth. Birth is produced in dependence on existence and so forth. That is the reverse sequence and helps us to better understand true suffering as the result being stressed, being to be discussed first as a result of the origin of suffering. All right. This we've thought about, we meditated on. And even if you haven't had any great insight as a, as a um, result of your meditation, some of these insights, they just pop up on different occasions. You may just be, I don't know, standing in the supermarket and just paying your bill, whatever, uh, be at the cashier and just paying for your, for your, for your, for what you bought. And then that moment, suddenly you have this, this, well, insight, whatever, it, it kind of goes deeper even in that moment, which is why we need to reflect on these, whatever is described in the Lam Rim, and certainly this is part of it, to think about this, reflect upon it, and that leads to insights, little insights that we gain, but that in turn, of course, 
um, affect our mind in a way such that we act differently and slowly move away from our samsaric existence. Okay. Now, the purified version of the 12 links, as I said, there's a forward sequence, there is a reverse sequence, and it's very easy. What does it help us to recognize? Well, the forward sequence, again, with the result, uh, it's actually the, the, the result being described first, which is like when you take the Four Noble Truth, you have the result, that's suffering, and the cause is the origin of suffering. So the result is described first, suffering is described first, and then the cause is described next. With regard to the purified version of the the purified version of those four truths, well, there are only two purified ones. The afflicted ones are suffering on the origin. And then the purified version of the truth is suffering and the cessation. Sorry, the path and the cessation. With the cessation being the cessation of suffering, in other words, liberation, being the result of practicing the path. Again, the, the path is the cause of the cessation not literally a cause as such because the cessation is permanent uh, so it cannot have a cause but it's kind of like cause and effect relationship in that the path has to come first to give rise to the cessation similarly here you have the forward sequence of the um, 12 links of the purified version of the 12 links which help us to recognize the truth of the path and then you have the reverse sequence, which help us to understand the cessation of suffering. The reversed version of the purified, or the, the reverse sequence of the purified version of the 12 links. Now, what is this purified version? The forward sequence, which helps us to understand um, the true path or the need also to, to, to develop the, to, to, the true path or the truth of the path the means and methods to attain liberation, in other words. Well, it is, it is reflecting upon when ignorance ceases, actions cease. So when there's no ignorance, there's no formative actions. If there's no formative actions, if formative, when, or if formative actions cease, consciousness ceases. In that, if you don't have act, formative actions, you don't have a consciousness that has to serve as the basis of the formative actions. And then when consciousness, when the form, well, first the cause of consciousness, when that ceases, resulting consciousness also ceases because there's no, there's no longer a consciousness that holds that particular seed, which is now reborn, and so forth, all the way to aging and death. When the first ceases, the rest ceases as well. That is the forward sequence of the purified version. And then likewise, you have the reverse sequence, which is the cessation of aging and death arises in dependence on the cessation of birth. So the cessation of aging and death, that being the result, that cessation of suffering, in other words, so there's no longer aging and death, in dependence on there's no longer, there's a cessation of birth. And that cessation of birth arises in dependence on the cessation of the um, of the actualized state of the karmic imprints, karmic imprint called the existence. When that is, so that the, the cessation of birth arises in dependence on the cessation of existence, and the cessation of existence arises in dependence on the cessation of um, grasping, and so forth. Okay, so. You see, as in the, the, the afflicted version, you have both sequences, you have the same now the other way around. It's not hard to understand. But like I said, it's still beneficial to meditate on it. So we've got a little bit of time left. Unless there's a question, we might as well just do this meditation once together because we probably won't do it on our own. <laughs> I mean, it'd be great if we would do it on our own. Uh, of course, if we really take the time and as I said, analytical meditation, it's not that you have to make a time that you have to, you, if it's great, if you can, but if you can't, how you can also deepen your understanding of these topics here. And please 
this is our problem. This is the problem, not just of us as Westerners. This is also the problem in the Tibetan uh, society that we have a tendency, we want to do the advanced practices. We feel like this is easy. I understand this. I don't want to really spend much time on it. I'd rather spend time on the more advanced well, Tantra, many people are involved in Tantra, but even without that, yeah, bodhicitta, Mahayana motivation, emptiness, and so forth. And that's fine. Of course, it's great to do that, but that we lack a basis. We lack a sound basis if we don't give this some thought. And even starting earlier, if you take the topics from the Lum Room, starting with, for instance, precious human rebirth, well, have we meditated on that enough or not? Well, obviously, if we still spend time being totally absorbed in the samsaric uh, activities with no remembrance of the Dharma, well, we obviously haven't spent time enough on that. And then when it comes to death. So if we really want to progress, maybe we spend a lot of time on bodhicitta. Great, wonderful, beautiful, but we need the basis. So I'm not discouraging one over the other no of course we need to enhance bodhicitta enhance compassion and so forth but without a sound basis giving it time we won't get there now my suggestion would be to read the lam rim if you have time to read the lam rim and with every topic just take a moment to reflect on it how does this how do i take this as personal advice how can i bring this into my daily life do that. If you have more time, take the extensive lam room. If you have less time, take the middling lam room. If you have very little time, at least once a day, either read, for instance, read and meditate on the songs of experience or the, uh, sh the concise lam room, as Holness recently taught, or at least gave the lung off, or read uh, Foundation of Vulgar Qualities, the, fun the three principal aspects of the path, and spend some time after each verse, the way we do it with the um, with the with the the prayers. Spend some time reflecting on each verse, just a few moments. And again, in that way, you you're taking your understanding, you deepen your understanding, um, creating a more stable basis for the other qualities to arise in a more effective way. Okay. Having said that, now here together, we deal with the 12 links. Um, and I would like to do the meditation together now. The purified version that is presented in the forward sequence and the purified version that is presented in as part or that is presented as part of the reverse sequence. Let's do this together. Um, and you have the example previously, thinking of yourself. Third rebirth is the rebirth as an animal. Second one is the one we have right now. The first one is the one that preceded the one right now. That was the rebirth we, in, during which we created the karmic seed, the formative karma, to be reborn as an animal in our next life. All right, taking that as the example, or if you feel uncomfortable with it, change the example. It's up to you. And just take a moment to reflect on these different um, sequences or on each of the steps of this, the, the two sequences. All right, and see how it affects the mind. And even if there's not a great insight you come to, never mind, it may arise at some other point. It definitely has an effect on the mind. Otherwise, it wouldn't be taught. Okay, so let's start the meditation. Once again, we start with breathing and then I guide you through the meditation. We start with the forward sequence of the purified version and then we do the reverse sequence.
as to the forward sequence with regard to the purified version of the 12 links. Think that when ignorance ceases, formative actions cease. That is, if there's no misapprehension of reality, then there is no throwing karma that could throw you into the existence of an animal. And when formative action ceases, the causal consciousness ceases. The causal consciousness ceases. In that, when there's no formative action, then you won't have a consciousness that holds the imprint that was left by that formative action. And when the causal consciousness ceases, the resultant consciousness ceases. In other words, if there is no causal consciousness of this, of the life when the formative action was accumulated that now holds the imprint of this formative action, then after death, after the separation from that causal consciousness from the mind, there is no resultant consciousness that also holds the seat of that formative action. And when there is no result in consciousness, there is no name and form. Which means if there's no result in consciousness that holds the seed of the formative action, there's also no conception of the mind that is the basis for the seat of the formative action that now enters and connects to the fertilized egg of the present life. And if there's no name and form, there are no six sense sources. We 
which means that there's no conception, no coming together of consciousness and the fertilized egg, then the six sense sources cannot develop in the womb of the mother. And if there's no six sense sources, there are no six consciousnesses which make contact with, that is, which perceive their respective objects. And if there's no contact, there is no feeling. In other words, if the sixth sense six consciousnesses do not perceive their objects, then there's no feeling. And if there's no feeling, there's no craving. that if there's no feeling that ordinarily would give rise to any of the afflictive emotions, then there's no craving for the self or craving for existence. If there's no craving, there's no grasping. And that craving cannot strengthen to turn into grasping. There's no craving in the first place. And if there's no grasping, there's no existence. That is, if there's no grasping, karmic seat, any type of samsaric karmic seat cannot ripen, cannot become active. And when there's no existence, there's also no birth. That is, there's no ripening of the karma that creates birth in an animal realm, for instance. Then there is no karmic force that throws the mental consciousness into a conception 
such that the mental consciousness connects to the fertilized egg of an animal. And if there's no conception, and therefore a new existence as an animal, there's no aging and there's no death as an animal. to now analyze the reverse sequence of the purified version of the 12 links. Which helps us to understand the cessation of suffering, the cessation of aging and death. For instance, as an animal arises in dependence on the cessation of birth that is there is no uncontrolled aging and death if there's no uncontrolled samsaric conception And the cessation of this conception depends on the cessation of the activated karmic seat that is existence. And the cessation of existence or the activation of this karmic seat is dependent on the cessation of grasping. Grasping at a self, grasping at existence in samsara. The cessation of grasping in turn is dependent on the Cessation of attachment or craving, in particular craving for samsaric existence, craving for the I. The cessation of that type of craving being dependent on the cessation of feeling, which automatically give rise to afflictive emotions. And 
and the cessation of that type of feeling depends on the cessation of the ordinary sixth sense consciousness making contact that is perceiving the particular object. And the cessation of these the perception, these the perception of these ordinary six awarenesses, that depends on the cessation of the six sense sources. The cessation of these six sense sources, that depends on the cessation of name and form, that is, of consciousness holding the karmic seat to be reborn in the animal realm, not to come together with a fertilized egg. And the cessation of name and form, that is cessation of consciousness holding the karmic seat of an animal rebirth, getting together with the new body, with the fertilized egg, that is dependent on the cessation of the resultant consciousness. Consciousness that has left the body of a previous life and holds the karmic seat, potentially throwing us into an animal existence. And the cessation of that result in consciousness is dependent on the cessation of the causal consciousness. A causal consciousness that has not yet left the body of the person who in that life accumulated the karmic seed to be reborn as an animal. of which this causal consciousness serves as a basis. And the cessation of that causal consciousness depends on the cessation are formative actions. Of stopping actions that cause rebirth in samsara. And lastly, the cessation of formative actions 
and of all the other links, they depend on the cessation of ignorance, a basic misapprehension of reality. to now conclude this analytical meditation on the purified version of the 12 links. Apply stabilizing meditation, focusing on this insight one pointedly in order for it to sink deeper into your mind. Okay, now slowly rise from your meditation. All right, now we have a few minutes left. We have a few minutes left um, to return to the text. We could now read the text. Uh, it's really easy to understand after everything we've done. And the reason I put a text there because this is usually the text, well, that seen as an authority on the 12 links it's not very long so let's just spend the last few minutes i hope it's okay if i add 10 minutes and then we just shorten the break sorry that was because of my mistake for you to get the full uh classes so if we could please um blend in yeah great show the text All right, there we go. Starting with the first verse. Yep. We have already read through it, but just for the sake of completion. So obscured by ignorance, of course, we all look obscured by ignorance. Existence recurs. So we continue to exist within cyclic existence. We already existed so far. And then it occurs again from performing any of the three kinds of formative actions. So the three kinds body, speech, and mind, or actions, virtues, and non-virtues that throw us into the desire realm existence, that is meritorious and non-meritorious actions, or virtuous actions that could give rise to rebirth in the form of formless realm, unfluctual or non-fluctuating actions. So you have meritorious, non-meritorious, and non-fluctuating uh, actions, three kinds, these different ones, formative actions through which one goes on to another rebirth. Okay, so we're reborn based on those. Conditioned by a formative action, consciousness, that is the third link, the causal consciousness holds the seeds of those formative actions. And now that consciousness leaves the body and in the form of the uh, resultant consciousness enters rebirth. That is, it enters um, a fertilized egg and that is the moment of name and form. 
And so now when consciousness has entered, as it says, name and form come into being. So this is the moment of conception when the consciousness that holds this formative action has entered another, uh, for, like has entered a new body. When name and form have come into being, then the six sources emerge through the cell division. As I said, the six senses now come into existence first in the form in which they cannot operate and then in a form in which they're active. So in dependence on these six sources, contact properly arises. So contact can properly take place because you have all the causes and conditions that now can give rise to the perception of an object. It arises only through the eye, a form and that which remembers. So taking the eye consciousness, which is the last to develop, it arises only through the eye sense power. So whatever is needed on the um, physical level, the uncommon empowering condition or eye sense power, as it's also called, a form, which is an external form, such as the side, sorry, a, a visual object, color, shape, and that which remembers, which is a previous moment, which is a previous moment of awareness. So that which remembers, for instance, the mental consciousness remembers things. So based on that, and that is quite interesting that it says that which remembers, because of course our sense perception is also influenced by our conceptual mind on based on a cultural background, etc. And there's some scientific um research on that too how much we perceive independence on with our sense consciousnesses independence on our cultural background on how familiar we we are with an object and so forth so this is nicely explained here with the second line it's dependent on what we remember our mental consciousness that holds everything we've learned then together with the eye sense power and the and the form the, the object itself then there's contact. Therefore, consciousness arises in dependence on name and form. Name here is a previous moment of consciousness, that which remembers. And form is now not the body as in name and form before, but the external object. That's also a form. It's not the physical form, the body, but it's an external form. So therefore, contact arises. Contact means a consciousness can arise. That is a combination of a previous moment of consciousness plus an external form, name and form, name here being consciousness. Contact is a combination of the three, I, form and consciousness. And from such contact, feeling always arises. Once you make contact, there's always a feeling, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. And because the mind is limited by the misperception, therefore there's a feeling and that feeling gives rise to all sorts of other afflictive emotions other than ignorance, like, uh, well, attachment, anger, and so forth. But in particular, at the moment of death, towards the end of our life, conditioned by feeling, there's craving. In the case of the end of our life, and the craving is for feeling, wanting to continue to feel like some samsaric feeling. I want to exist. I want to continue to exist as a person. And here uh, Nagarjuna talks about craving feeling. Of course, that is true on a daily basis. But of course, more so when we die, we continue to be alive, to feel. So whenever there is this craving, grasping of four kinds arise, arises. The four kinds I've given to you, I've, I've described it, uh, of four kinds. One of the four kinds may arise. Um, there's craving for the sense objects. There's craving for philosophical views, craving for uh, believing a certain unethical behavior and, and certain unethical practices to be spiritual practices. I kind of formulated it differently before, but let me just look for the way I put it before. Oh, grasping at the different forms of ethical disciplines and most mode of conduct, which are actually no real ethical discipline to be supreme. And lastly, grasping at the self. And here it's mainly at the time of death of the four types is the craving or the grasping at the self. Okay. So here in verse number six, Nagarjuna speaks more generally. There's, in general, through our life, there's feeling, we crave feeling, there's craving for 
having pleasant experiences and then there's the different types of grasping they give rise but of course at the time of death then it's very specific craving and grasping so number seven when there's grasping existence of the one who grasps a curse now existence still in the form of the person so in the form of the cause where the karmic seed ripens when the karmic seed ripens and then this person it gives rise to actual existence that is birth of the one who grasps so it's not like someone else grasping it's the person who in the previous life experienced grasping now their existence is given in the next life through birth so he doesn't spell out existence and birth he doesn't use those words but that's implied when there's no grasping one is freed and will not come into existence so if there was no grasping if we attained liberation because we removed ignorance then the link ignorance is gone but there's also no grasping and that means even if the karmic seat if the karmic seat um, were still there it's no longer a karmic seat in that it can no longer it is a seed yes but it no longer has the potential to give rise to a next rebirth if we can then show number eight Yes, existence, moreover, is the five aggregates. There we go again. It, it describes it as the five aggregates. And through existence, ordinarily, birth occurs. Here, existence, as in like that form, this actualized form, he's just stressing previously, he's stressing, well, if you didn't have grasping, no matter what the seeds on your mind are, they couldn't occur. But if there is grasping, existence being the five aggregates. So we give the name of the exact the the result the five aggregates which is birth where name and form come together consciousness feeling discrimination everything that comes along with consciousness that comes together with the um the the fertilized egg that is the actual moment of existence which was previously ripened during the 10th link of existence and so, therefore, through existence, that ripened form of the karma, then birth occurs. That is this birth, which is the actual existence, existence of birth, which refers to the coming together of a fertilized egg and the other mental and the, and the consciousness, which is you have the five aggregates in that moment. And following from that, aging, death and sorrow, limitation and suffering unhappiness and distress all come from being born thus these exclusively painful aggregates come into being okay so these aggregates that hold the potential for so much suffering since formative action of course motivated by ignorance is the root of cyclic existence the wise don't act out of ignorance it needs to be explained it's not just the wise don't act it's not like you just sit there like a piece of wood no uh, according to the explanation that's given in the commentary you don't act out of ignorance but the unwise of those who are whose minds are still directed by ignorance they are agents as in like they act in a way um, that creates new formative actions but not the wise because they see suchness so here wise as in like generating the wisdom that understands phenomena as they really are when ignorance has stopped formative actions will not occur ignorance is stopped by awareness meditating on suchness so here the text is saying well the only antidote to ignorance is uh, the understanding how phenomena really exist so it's not any other method that helps us to really eliminate uh, ignorance the only way to really eliminate ignorance is understand the object of the mind of ignorance what is the object of of the ignorance the object that it perceives is phenomena existing inherently so we need to understand the opposite that phenomena do not exist inherently and the classic example for that um for the the mechanics if you like of the way this takes place is if you believe there is the classic of misperception of maybe a child there's a monster in your closet there's a monster underneath your bed the only way you can remove that misapprehension which gives rise to fear it gives rise to insomnia and so forth well the only way to get rid of it it's not it's not done by taking a sleeping pill or, I don't know, counting sheep or what have you. 
the only way to really effectively remove this misapprehension is to look for the monster. If you perceive a monster underneath your bed, well, check it out. Look exactly in that place. Don't look anywhere else. Look exactly where you perceive this monster. And if likewise, our whole life is controlled by a sense, I, 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 a very strong sense of holding on to an I and my happiness. Well, if that is the troublemaker, that misapprehension, let's look for this I. Let's not look anywhere else, but let's look. Where's the I? Does it exist the way it appears? How about other people who appear in a similar way? There seems to be something really there, objectively there. Let's look for it. It should become clearer. If it's really there, the more we, we research it, the more we explore it, the closer it should become, the, the clearer it should become. Okay. Therefore, meditating on suchness is really checking out the object that so vividly appears, identifying that, and then looking for it. And if we cannot find it, and there's no way, although it appears so vividly, well, it couldn't be there. This vivid appearance, it's like an optical illusion. It, it seems to be there, but when you look for it, we find out it cannot be found. And only then we check is there a monster underneath the closet? It's not there. I can very decisively say, it seems that way. It appears to me, but it's not there. Then everything that arises from the misapprehension will stop. Through the stopping of that, then that, and that will not manifest. So because the stopping of ignorance, then everything else, formative actions, causal consciousness, name and form, and so forth, will not manifest. The exclusively painful aggregates cease to exist in this way. All right. Okay, great. Sorry. I was a little bit, I'm a little bit over time. So let's take a break now. Will 20 minutes do? Will 20 minutes be enough for our last session? Or do you need a little longer? Now we've got quarter, yeah. to, quarter to two, two, no, in your, where you are, it's quarter to four. Maybe we do 25. 25 minutes. Perfect. Okay. 25 minutes. 15 minutes, 10 past four, where you are, 10 past four, we'll meet again in 25 minutes. Okay, so take a moment. Let's not lose the virtue we accumulated. Let's just do a quickie, a quick dedication. Let's dedicate it towards our own enlightenment for the welfare of all sentient beings. Okay, great. 25 minutes, I'll see you in 25 minutes. <laughs> 